Dr. Hathaway holds appointments at Johns Hopkins University as an adjunct professor of obstetrics and gynecology and at George Washington University as an associate clinical professor of healthcare sciences. He's currently the senior technical advisor for reproductive health at Japigo. I had to look up how to say that, as well as a member of Population Connections Board of Directors. <laughs> and with that, take it away, Mark. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Natalie and Stephanie, for helping, and Bryce for jumping in. So the reason we had the music playing was because uh, I developed this talk some time ago talking about the contraceptive mechanisms of action, how birth control pills or birth control methods work. And when I was thinking about it, I um, started in the womb where it happens, and it plays along nicely with that Hamilton song, In the Room Where It Happens. So that's why the little music was playing in the background. I hope some of you caught on to that pun. Um, and I'm going to cover some topics that in my healthcare work or my training of trainers mainly in the reproductive uh, realm, I found that many, many clinicians in particular um, had a hard time understanding that none of the birth control methods that we use uh, cause an abortion. And I also found that many, many clinicians had a hard time uh, providing a contraceptive method to a woman when they couldn't guarantee that she was pregnant or not. And that just uh, riled me. So I developed this talk with some funding, or we developed this talk with some funding from USAID and a colleague of mine who's an illustrator. And you'll see some of the, the, um, or the um, diagrams coming up in a few seconds. So we're going to cover the basic female anatomy. Uh, Bryce is going to help us walk through that. Then I'm going to talk about what's what we refer to as reasonably certain. And reasonably certain is in quotes because it comes from the CDC and the WHO. And if you can be reasonably certain a woman is not pregnant, you can go ahead and proceed to provide her a contraceptive method. And then uh, I'm going to talk about several mechanisms of action, and we'll touch on a few contraceptive methods. And then lastly, that I'll drive home that last point. OK, so uh, take it away, Bryce. So we're going to start here with sure. the basic anatomy. I'm hoping for most of you, this is somewhat something you may have seen, perhaps even in your early days of high school, your sex ed classes. <laughs> um, but this is a basic female anatomy, and Bryce is going to help us name some of these structures. I'm hoping you can all see my sure. cursor. And so I'm going to point to a few things. So Bryce, can you tell me what this is? Yeah, that is uh, one of the ovaries. That's an ovary, exactly. So a woman has two ovaries. They're roughly the size of about a, maybe a large almond, um, maybe a little bit bigger. And then how about this? What's this structure? Uh, yeah, into the fallopian tubes. These are the fallopian tubes, exactly. So one on this side and then one on the other side. And these little things up here are called fimbria. We won't get into that. And then this structure, this large structure in the middle, that's the uterus. The body of the uterus. And this part right up at the top is what we call the fundus or the top part of the uterus. And then down here, we have this structure, this kind of a, almost like a tube-like structure. Yeah, that's the vagina. Nice, exactly, fantastic. And then there's a fancy word we use for the opening into the uterus. It's right here, this structure right here. Yeah, that is the cervix. Fantastic, so you got it. So beautiful, so that's the basics. Um, why we use such tough words, I don't know, but at any rate. And, the, and the, you know, the typical uh, uterus of a woman is about the size of a fist um, when it's not pregnant. So I use my hand sometimes when I'm trying to demonstrate things to, to clients or patients. It works well. So we're going to now jump, and Bryce is going to continue to help us talk about um, the kind of I've, I've laid over here a typical menstrual cycle, which is typically about 28 days long. And so a typical menstrual cycle or a typical woman would bleed for roughly how many days? 
would you say, Bryce or anyone? Uh, yep. Let's say it again. Three, Sorry. Of three about, to five. About three to five. So we'll we'll call this end of menses. And then if we if we move along this timeline, what's the next thing that happens? Somewhere I'll stop when I think you should tell me something. About, about right in the middle would be the uh, would be ovulation. Bingo, bingo, exactly, exactly. So ovulation occurs roughly at day fourteen, and um, you know it's not exact. It may happen a few days earlier, a few days later, but roughly at day fourteen or so, a woman ovulates, and that is depicted here. These little cysts form on an ovary all the time. There's all these, all these cysts forming all, the, all along. And then one of them develops into a little follicular uh, pop or a little follicle pops out and the egg, not drawn to scale here, but the egg starts, uh, pops out and it gets pulled into the uh, fallopian tube and starts make, making its way down here. So then, if this particular uh, womb or woman, or uh, yeah, we'll call it the womb, if this particular person were to have a uh, intercourse, um, what would be the next thing that would happen? And uh, when? Yeah, we would uh, go the fertilization itself. Actually. Yeah, uh, yeah, I should have probably given you a little better hint, but yes, exactly right. So when the egg or the sperm, the sperm meets the egg, that's what we call fertilization. And it usually happens about three days after uh, sex occurs. So a woman has intercourse, and this is uh, my, my colleague Erica Troncoso designed to drew this. This is like an ejaculate, this foamy white stuff. And then again, not drawn to scale, but a little tiny sperm travels up and roughly at day 17, it hits the egg and that's called fertilization. That's what's called fertilization. Okay. And then the next thing that happens is this fertilized egg starts traveling down the tube into the uterus and it hits, hits is not the right word, but it lands in the inside of the uterus and that's called what? It starts with an I. Implantation? Implantation, and that occurs roughly six or seven days after ovulation. So implantation occurs, and that's when the fertilized egg begins to burrow into the wall of the uterus, and that's what we call implantation. And that indeed is the definition or how we define pregnancy or when a pregnancy begins at time of implantation because it's a definable moment. We can actually do a test to determine that that has actually occurred. Um, Bryce, thank you very much. I'll take it from here. You did fantastic, thanks. <laughs> thank you. If any volunteers jump up for anything else, let me know. All right, so uh, the next thing that happens is that this fertilized egg uh, develops these hormones or a hormone called the uh, beta HCG and the human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. And it's produced by the placental tissue of this fertilized egg. This fertilized egg starts very early on developing some placental tissue and that hormone starts going into the wall of the uterus. So if I were to do a blood test, say, two or three days later, it would probably show up positive. A blood pregnancy test, what we call a measure of quantitative blood test for that hormone, would probably show up roughly around day 23. But we rarely use blood tests anymore for, for um, pregnancy determination. We use what we refer to as UPTs or urine pregnancy tests. They're incredibly sensitive these days. And after that, the hormone is spills into the bloodstream, then it spills into the kidneys or travels through the, the blood and gets into the kidneys, it's filtered out and it comes out in the urine. And that probably is another two to three days later. And that's where we would be able to detect the urine pregnancy test at day 25 or so. So indeed, we could actually determine if a woman were pregnant or not, even before she's missed a period. 
it's unlikely that a woman would be checking a pregnancy test that early, but indeed she could if she were wanted to, or a couple could. And some of the reproductive endocrinologists do that actually. But that's kind of the overlay of how I want to um, have a quick, brief understanding of the things that occur during this uh, with female anatomy and the reproductive, we'll call this reproductive, this is beyond 101, this is reproductive 202. All right, so I'm gonna move now. If we don't have any other volunteers, anyone volunteer to jump in here? Anyone wanna answer this question? They haven't, but I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> okay, Natalie. Okay. So tell me, if, if a woman came to you, mm -hmm. um, what would be a couple of questions you would ask her? She came, let's say she comes into you today and she says, you know, uh, I've heard about um, birth control pills. I really want to start taking birth control pills. Uh, what would be a couple of things you would ask her? Um, I mean, the first question would be, when was your last period? Fantastic. Fantastic. That's the first question in just about any reproductive healthcare setting. One would get asked that question. When, when, uh, when was the last time you had uh, a period or when was your last menstrual period? And you'd want to define, you know, is it, was it a regular period? How typically, how I many days do you bleed? So, but most, most, most women can tell you roughly when their last period was. Um, and then your, the next question you would say to them or ask, so say um, this woman says, yeah, my last menstrual period was uh, 12 days ago. Mm -hmm. What would then would you ask her? What would be another question you would ask her? When did you last have sexual intercourse? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so with those two questions that you just asked, mm -hmm. uh, you can be pretty darn reasonably certain a woman is pregnant or not pregnant. You, the second question has a bit of a caveat to it. It's, it's when she had sexual intercourse, but was that sexual intercourse protected or not? Did she, was she using condoms? Was she using another birth control method? So if she comes into you seeking a change in a birth control method and she's been do, using pills, for example, then you, know, you can be reasonably certain she's not pregnant. So um, I'm gonna move on a little bit. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, so this is a, a little questionnaire that came up, uh, USAID paid for and w, uh, the FHI 360 developed. Basically, six questions that you can ask. And I'm not going to go through these because I find it a bit more than what typical clinicians could use or need. But it was developed with the idea of we know that uh, urine pregnancy tests are tough to come by in lots of developing countries, lots of low resource settings, even in our country sometimes. And so, therefore, a quick questionnaire like this can go a long way to helping determine whether a woman's uh, pregnant or not. This is another similar chart. Uh, it's an even a little more complicated, but as Natalie just pointed out, one can be reasonably sure that a woman is not pregnant by two simple questions. When was her last menstrual period? And when, whoops, sorry. And when was the last uh, time she engaged in intercourse? And then whether it was a protector or not. Does that make sense? I'm hoping people are still with me here. Um, so now, if I were to have some volunteers, I would ask them to tell me a little bit about what I would do with a couple of these. And I'm going to go through these fairly rapidly since we don't have any volunteers. Um, but if a woman came in to me, let's say this person, uh, we'll say scenario two, a woman named Jalala comes in and she wants birth control pills today. So you would ask her when her last menstrual period was. And she said, it's about, we'll say it's about 10 days ago. You wouldn't need anything more. She hasn't ovulated yet. You don't need to ask her any other questions. If she tells you, well, I had intercourse yesterday or I had intercourse five days ago, be good to know that. It's a good question that's important to ask. But at the same time, you can be reasonably certain she's not pregnant because she hasn't ovulated yet. So that's, uh, you can provide her any and all contraceptive methods today. You don't have to wait for her to have her come on in period. 
you don't have to need to know anything more. You want to make sure that you know you, she has a pretty good handle on her last menstrual period. So then I'm going to go to this scenario. This is the one's a little trickier. So if a woman came in here, Annie, for example, she comes into you today and she says, "My last menstrual period was 17 days ago." Then you'd want to ask her. So uh, okay, Annie, you know, it looks like you want a contraceptive method today. Um, we can help you. Can you tell me? Uh, when you had last unprotected intercourse. And she says, well, I had unprotected intercourse. Uh, it was, um, I know it was on my birthday. Let's see, it was September 4. So I guess that wouldn't work out right if today's the 24th. Any rate, um, but you would, you, if she says she has intercourse somewhere in here, that's all you need to know because she hadn't ovulated yet when she had unprotected intercourse or whether it was protected or unprotected. So you could go ahead and provide her with a contraceptive method today. You wouldn't need any other tests. Now in most, if not all settings in the United States, we do pregnancy tests on women whenever they walk in the door almost if they're of reproductive age. But your pregnancy test really isn't gonna be needed, um, nor would it be all that helpful. If Annie says to you, I had unprotected intercourse two days ago, then all bets are off. You, she could be developing, she could be developing, or an egg may have popped out and the sperm may have be on its way to hitting the egg. It could be already fertilized if you're off or she's off a day or two. So there could be a developing or a fertilized egg traveling probably hasn't implanted yet. And so it'd be somewhere here maybe. So if you did a pregnancy test, it would be negative. And yet it would probably, it just wouldn't show up anything. So indeed you'd have to tell this one, well, we can't be certain that you're not pregnant or not. Therefore, maybe we wanna wait. Um, what if, yeah, like it's hard to do this without, um, answering my own question, but uh, if for some reason you, let me, let me, actually I'm gonna jump one other, one other one. So let's do this one. So if Davina comes in and she's kind of the same story and she had unprotected intercourse here and maybe, maybe your pregnancy test is negative, but maybe it's potentially positive in here, probably not quite. So she's also in the midst of developing a, a pregnancy. Your pregnancy tests aren't going to help you that much. But if you, she says, you know, I'm, I'm going out of the country tomorrow and I really, really need a contraceptive method. Can I start something today? What would be the downside of providing her contraceptive method, hormonal contraceptive method uh, in this particular event? The answer is nothing. We know from lots and lots of studies and lots and lots of research and women who've used contraceptive methods all the way through their pregnancy, there's no detrimental effect. And therefore we, part of the reason I do these talks is to help providers, clinicians, help women get a contraceptive method when they're in the setting with you so that they don't have to go through hoops to come back to you. And you can help them get a contraceptive method in many, many circumstances even if you're not 100% certain. Um, and most of us wouldn't do that in the recognition that there's a potential that she could be pregnant. But at the same time, if you weren't inadvertently to provide her something, it would do little to no harm or no harm at all to the pregnancy. The caveat to that is a intrauterine device. Um, if you were to provide an intrauterine device and there was a developing pregnancy, that could indeed disrupt a pregnancy. Um, but all the other contraceptive methods, hormonal contraceptive methods are very safe and, and do no, have no impact on, um, on, uh, on a developing pregnancy or on the mother. Okay, so let's touch on how are we doing for time? I guess we're pretty good here. We're okay on time. Um, we have a few volunteers too, Mark. If you, oh, let fantastic. Me know when you yeah, there's a few people right there. Um, let's, uh, did anyone volunteer to talk about tier-based effectiveness counseling? Not that specifically, but I bet we can get someone to do it. Okay, here's a hint. 
anyone. Marion? Oh, I'll do it. Yeah. I'll do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I was about to call you out, but I was waiting. No guarantees here. I don't know. I don't know if I have this down, but my assumption, especially looking at this chart, is that tier based counseling would be counseling patients starting with the most effective methods first and then giving them all the options that are that are less effective as you run through the list. Fantastic. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you very much for that. Marion, is that who I heard? Yeah. Yep. Yes, exactly right. And and you know, there's there's so many ways to talk to women about contraceptive methods. There's just so many ways. There's lots and lots. I could do talks and talks and talks on counseling methods for contraceptive methods. And you know, some people argue that effectiveness isn't the most important thing for women. There's lots of other ways to talk. And yet I kind of like this because it provides a, a good, sh uh, these, these come in tearaway sheets. It shows you can talk about all the methods just pointing to them. So these are the most effective methods. Some people refer to this as the most moderate, most effective, moderate effective and least effective. So these implants, the IUDs, sterilization, vasectomy, these are the most effective methods. And these are injectables. Uh, the one that's most common in our country and most countries is Depo-Provera. And then there's the lactation and amenorrhea method, the pills, patch, ring. And then these methods down here are the least effective. But this is a nice way to help women kind of understand if they're interested in effectiveness. Um, and then in the US, there's a chart that's um, a bit, I find it a bit more user-friendly, a bit more colorful, obviously. Um, it's put together by this entity called the Bedsider. Bedsider.org is a fantastic uh, website. It's a nonprofit, so I direct women to it all the time. I tell them, you know, you can get really, really great information from an unbiased source. I let people know that, you know, Dr. Google did not go to medical school. Um, and this is a great source because it's unbiased. They're going to give you the straight story so that you can zoom in and there's, there's little scenarios from patients about these. When I show this every now and then, I show it to patients and say, oh, I want the five-star method or I want the, yeah, I want the one that's the best. So at any rate, these are, these are, this is a nice little chart. And this again comes off and it, it, it's, uh, you can get this in a tear away. Um, so that's what's called tier-based effectiveness. The next topic is now we're gonna get to mechanisms of action of several different, uh, there's basically four different mechanisms of action. And if we have any volunteers, that somebody wants to talk about IUDs, this would be the time. Sure, we had someone, um, Rita. Yes, Great. hi everyone. Hi, hi Rita. Rita. <laughs> Super. Hi, hi. We can see you. So Rita, tell, tell me a few things um, about IUDs. I would um, what, love what are the to, two main you. types of IUDs? Yes, uh, the two main are the hormonal and non-hormonal, and there's a variety of hormonal IUDs, but the most popular one that most of us are probably familiar with is the Mirena, and the main hormone in that is progestin. If progestin, I'm, fantastic. Progestin, sorry, yes, I'm pronouncing no, no, it correctly. Fantastic. Um, no, that's perfect. Stop I, there. Stop there. Oh, sorry, yes, of course. Stop there. So you're exactly right. There's a Mirena. The brand name is um, in our country is Mirena. Somewhat it's getting out in, the, in lower resource countries now. There's another exact same thing in our country now. There's a, another one that's a trade name, Lyletta, but they're exact same. Um, and then there's a, several others, a Skyla, Kylina, but basically this group, the hormonal IUDs are what you're referring to. And great thing that you just mentioned is that they're progestin. It's a progestin is the hormone that's in that, uh, in those uh, little, little um, tube that's the reservoir. I'm gonna, can you guys see this? I'm holding up one right now. They're really small and they're flexible. So it's got this little top part. So whenever I talk about contraceptive methods with women, I wanna have one so I can actually show it to them and they can touch it and feel it. And then I use my fist and I say, you know, this is a cervix, goes into the uterus, sits in there like that, and the little strings come out. So it's really helpful to be able to show those methods um, and then let uh, women touch them and feel them. Um, and they, let's see, how effective are these hormonal contraceptive methods? Or are these hormone, hormonal IUDs? 99%. They're incredibly effective, exactly. 
even even better, probably 99.4 or 99.5. So they're incredibly effective. And the safety part of them is they're incredibly safe because they have progestin. So we worry about women who have a history of blood clots or blood clotting issues, stroke issues, high blood pressure issues uh, with estrogen containing methods. So the progestin only methods, which these are, are incredibly safe for lots and lots and lots of women. There's very, very few women uh, that couldn't use a hormonal IUD. Same thing holds true for the copper IUD. Can you tell me anything about the copper IUD? Uh, yeah, that, that is non-hormonal and it's generally larger. I definitely understand that there's usually a little bit uh, more pain involved, especially uh, during the period flow is uh, higher. So it's not necessarily uh, a lot of people's favorite method, but if a person does not want to rely on, or not just rely, but to have hormonal types of side effects, then um, that might be preferred. Fantastic, fantastic. And how effective is it? I believe it's also around 99.5%. Almost the same, exactly. The difference is ever so slight. It's incredibly effective. Likelihood of a woman getting pregnant with an IUD in, in her body, either one, uh, is almost zilch. And you're right, and it's the same size. You can perhaps see it. Um, same size as the hormonal IUD, basically. And you're right in it. And what I talk about, um, it's like a readjustment or an adjustment um, time frame. The first three or four months, women tell us that they have slightly heavier cramping and slightly more bleeding their, their first three or four months of periods. But then most women that tell us they don't notice a difference from their previous um, menses. And it's fantastic for women who say that, you know, they don't want to have any hormones in their system. The amount of hormone that's actually in the hormonal IUD is really, really small. So it doesn't really matter that much. Um, the women who have trouble with hormones are the ones that have larger doses of hormones in the pill or the patch or the ring, for example, or the depo provera. But at the same time, a woman says she doesn't want any hormones. This is a fantastic choice for her. Um, incredibly safe. And uh, how long does the copper IUD last? 10 years compared to the- Yeah, it's, it's FDA approved actually up for 12 years. Um, you know, and if you, and I use, I like to say it's up to, so if a woman says she wants, you know, to get pregnant two or three years from now, it's a fantastic choice. She just takes it out whenever she, you know, doesn't want to use it anymore. So it's up to 12 years. And the hormonal IUDs, let's say this one, how, how, how long does that one last? About five years. Yeah, it's actually up to now. We now know good evidence shows it's up to seven years. Very good. Yep. So this is, these are incredibly safe, simple, and effective methods. Fantastic. Thank you very much. All right. And we didn't ask this question, but uh, maybe you can answer it if you're still on. Uh, how does this copper IUD work? Uh, I believe it's the copper itself that kills the sperm. Yeah, pretty much. It, 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 we think of it as it, it's the sperm just are incapacitated. They don't swim well anymore. They, they can't get to the egg, basically. You know, so there's some people have thought, well, maybe this blocks the tubes. It doesn't work that way, really. It's these copper ions that are depicted here, and they basically incapacitate the sperm. So the sperm cannot swim very well and never get to the egg. So fertilization doesn't happen. So that's, this is the the only method that works that way. So I'm gonna to jump to the other group of uh, methods. Uh, we're now on to condoms, the two different types of condoms, of course, male condoms, female condoms, and these basically block the sperm. So the sperm, again, can never get to the egg. Um, the third group is this group of um, methods. We know that the cervix is particularly susceptible or sensitive to progestins. So these hormonal IUDs that you mentioned a few minutes ago, this is, this is depicting, depicting these little blue dots, depicting the hormone that's released. And it's uh, released systemically all over the body, but main action or main focus is right here around the cervix. So it thickens the cervix, <clears throat> excuse me. So the sperm can't get through and therefore don't never get to the egg. It also ha has a secondary mechanism that probably inhibits ovulation to a certain degree. And then the, the implant is another method that we're gonna to touch on in a couple seconds, but that also has a secondary mechanism that works 
mainly primarily here, same thickening of the cervix, but it may also inhibit ovulation. Now I'm jumping to the next uh, mechanism of action. That those are the methods, these are the methods that prevent or inhibit ovulation. So, you know, the one that's that most people are familiar with, birth control pills, have been around for 60 some years now. Um, they basically trick the body into triggering different hormone levels and it, uh, you get a jolt of a hormone every day and it basically inhibits the egg from popping out. The injectables, Depo-Provera, for example, works that way. Implants um, work that way to a certain degree. Emergency contraceptive pills. Uh, there was a question in the chat and uh, submitted questions about emergency contraceptive pills. We call them emergency contraception because we used to refer to those as morning and after, but we know that you can take them up to three days or even longer um, and they will prevent uh, ovulation or thwart ovulation. And then there's the lactation amenorrhea method, which I won't get into, but also works well provided women use it to inhibit ovulation. So when we put together this slide, we finished up, whoops, sorry. When we put together this talk, we finished up and created this one pager um, that's, that's this basically. And it, it, it's, uh, my colleagues in the field felt this was really, really great because it has all the methods listed here and in the four groups and categories that I just pointed out to you with laid over the anatomy. And it basically helps uh, providers understand how contraceptive methods work. None of them, none of them, as we pointed out, uh, cause abortions. They all work by preventing the egg and the sperm from ever getting together or preventing fertilization. So that's um, what we, you know, we help providers in particular understand and women who are fearful of a method that they may have heard causes abortions because none of these methods cause abortions. Some methods, um, one last little slide, some methods lead to a thinning. A lot of the hormonal methods that have progestin or progestin only thin the uterine lining so that women have slightly less bleeding or no bleeding at all. And a lot of women love that. Um, a lot of women say, no, 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 I want to have a period every month. But at any rate, uh, those women that want to understand why they're not having period. It's not as though the blood fills up inside the uterus and gets stuck and uh, the, bleeding, the, the blood never develops. That's how we explain that to women. So reiterating, I'm reiterating that implantation is how we define pregnancy. And you know, this will, politicians beat this around, uh, religious leaders, philosophers that beat it around for years and years and years, but we have a defining moment when we can measure something and that's when how we define the FDA, the CDC, WHO, ACA, lots and lots of organizations, all the scientific bodies agree that this is the definition of pregnancy. And this helps to dispel those myths that none of these methods cause abortions. So I think on that note, um, this is the organization that was funding this presentation. So I think I'll go back maybe to this slide and then we can entertain some questions if there are questions. Um, yeah, you ready Stephanie for and Natalie. Sure. I'm, so we do have one question from Rita. She asked, wouldn't the marginal possibility of an epictopic pregnancy from the IUD forced an abortion? Huh. Uh, possibly, yes, you're right. You're, I guess you're right. I mean, the chances of that happening are pretty darn slim. Um, you know, that, that's it's an interesting point that I, I'm glad you brought it up because it's, we often talk about ectopic pregnancies. Ectopic pregnancies are, you know, the incidence in the United States is probably one to 2% of every, or one or two of every hundred women who is, are having unprotected intercourse of an ectopic pregnancy can occur. The likelihood of them having a pregnancy at all if they're using an effective contraceptive method is really, really low. And then the chances of them having an ectopic if they're using a contraceptive method that's effective is even lower than that. So it's kind of like a really, really tiny number multiplied by a really tiny number is a really, really, really tiny number. 
So in other words, it gets misconstrued that IUDs can lead to higher risk of, of ectopic pregnancy. That's actually incorrect. If a woman is using a contraceptive method that's effective, the chances of her having an ectopic pregnancy drop tremendously. Any contraceptive method that's effective, and IUDs are the most effective. So, <clears throat> but yes, indeed, if a woman were to develop pregnancy with an IUD in place, she may have slightly higher chance of having an ectopic, but that risk is really, really diminished. And it's, almost not worth talking about. It's better to help her get a contraceptive method that's effective. So, good question. I hope I, I didn't confuse that. Um, there was a question about Norplant that I'll add, answer real quickly. A long time ago, I guess not that long ago, uh, maybe 20 some years ago, there was a contraceptive hormonal implant um, Actually, if, if there are still volunteers, anybody wants to talk about the hormonal implant, this would be the time. Um, yeah, John said he would like to talk about oh, that. Oh, John, John go, for go for it. Tell us what you know about the hormonal contraceptive implant. Well, um, uh, in a lot of talks, I use a slide uh, from Guttmacher that shows uh, if you have 10,000 American women who are heterosexual, sexually active, and in their childbearing years, uh, how many would get pregnant using different methods? And I mask the numbers and then ask people to, sometimes I award the lucky winner with a $10 Starbucks card. Uh, and uh, people are, are really surprised to find out that uh, uh, I believe, if I'm not on it in front of me, I'm doing it from memory. I think with birth control pills, out of 10,800 will get pregnant in a typical year. But with uh, implants, uh, that gets reduced to five. Uh, yeah, so let me go back. So I'm, I'm going to direct. So here, if you can see this on the far right. So pills, six to nine in, of 100 women could get pregnant in a year less than one in a hundred. So the hormonal rod, uh, John, can you tell us about what it looks like and the size of it? Well, it, uh, I've, of course you're giving me a, a nice picture there, but it's, it's about the size of a, of a say a Q-tip minus the, the cotton balls. On yeah, it's about right. It's about the size of a matchstick. The one in our country is called Nexplanon. There's several that are used in uh, globally, there are two rods. They're basically about the same size, and it goes where? Where do where do we place it? Inside upper arm. Yep. And how long does it last? Uh, I uh, my number's probably out of date, but uh, three to four years. Five. It's we now know it's effective five. up to five. It's FDA approved for three, but we have really really great evidence that you can leave it in for five years it still provides the same amount of protection so it's good for up to five years incredibly effective incredibly safe incredibly simple to use um, and you're exactly right it goes in the in a woman's upper arm um, uh, just under the skin and I, I find that people are really surprised to find out that it's more effective than vasectomies or tubal ligation exactly exactly it's the most effective method out there and it's more effective than a vasectomy or a tubal ligation or rivals though. I mean, the difference is really small, but it's incredibly effective. Um, it's, it's surprisingly not utilized as much as, as, as it could be. Fantastic. If I can just follow up on a question yeah. there, do you, I know that there, there are I mean, different cultures, different countries, different circumstances. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what the most prominent barriers are to utilization and oh boy. how to remove those? Yeah, and oh, what are the most prominent barriers to the implants? Uh, in, in low resource countries, definitely cost. Um, although many governments have made them available at low cost or no cost. Um, it, you know, the, the, the question about barriers to contraceptive use globally are just really hard to delve into because they vary so much. Um, there's health system issues, even if you have the implant in your health setting, for example, then you have to make sure you have trained providers and you make, have to make sure you have some of the tools and equipment needed. Um, you have to have developed a way to, you know, explain the method. Um, you know, there's, yeah, there's just the barriers are, 
are many and they vary tremendously from place to place. There's cultural barriers, um, you know, religious barriers. Someone asked a great question about all the different barriers and they did, there's just no really straight, easy answer. What, what is a barrier, you know, in, in, in Washington DC, for example, you know, there's people in parts of the city that know about implants and love them. And then there's another part of the city where people have never even heard of an implant and are near nervous about it. And, and so, uh, yeah, lots and lots of barriers, but probably globally, the biggest one is cost. And then and this, they're figuring out ways to bring it down. There's now a Chinese produced um, two rod system called Levo plant. That's DKT is trying to get out. Um, I started to get to the question about Norplant and Norplant was a method that was used in our country. It had six rods. It was good for up to five years and it developed all kinds of different problems. Um, people were having trouble getting them out. And then there was also the silicon issue. It was made with using silicon. So there was some fears of litigation. So they, the, the company that was marketing it, uh, took it off the market. And, um, but then we have this fantastic newer one now called Nexplanon that's available, which is, and, and globally there's a couple other names for it, but uh, what else? Um, um, just had another question come through. If you have any thoughts about the best way to increase the availability of these most effective methods, which you just spoke to a little bit about, you know, speaking about the implant, how it's not as available because it's expensive. So yeah it's hard to it's hard to say you know in our country we've seen a slow but steady uptake of what are referred to as long acting reversible contraceptive methods and that's those in this top tier um and yet you know it's still surprisingly low you know many many women still have not heard or if they've heard of those methods they just don't know enough about them to make a good choice um then, the, then there's the issue of providers. But in our country, we've seen a drop, a tremendous drop, uh, not tremendous, but a slow, steady drop in unplanned, unexpected, unintended pregnancies. Um, it's been slow, but it probably has a lot to do with the uptake of the more effective contraceptive methods. <clears throat> At least we think that's one of the reasons. In the rest of the world, boy, it just varies so much. Um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to, there, there, was, there was a question about, you know, what would help in low resource countries. And, and we know that it's kind of, it seems like an oxymoron or sometimes, sometimes not, uh, right, it seems incorrect, but we know that places where we've been able to provide simple, safe access to abortion care and aligned with simple, safe access to family planning methods. That's where we've seen the most steady drop in unplanned, unexpected pregnancies and unplanned, unexpected abortions. Um, <clears throat> not to mention a tremendous reduction in maternal mortality globally. So it's surprising, but where we've made easy, safe, simple access to methods, uh, both abortion care and uh, contraceptive care. We've seen those are the places where we've seen drops in unplanned pregnancies and maternal mortality rates drop. Uh, there's a follow-up question to that. If you know how effective early sex education is in encouraging the use of most effective methods. Wow, that's a great question. I, I someone had asked a similar question and I had an answer that was, you know, if we could talk about and be, not be fearful about talking about sex and early in, you know, kids' lives, you know, I dream of the day where, you know, a 15-year-old boy will talk to his grandfather and they'll talk about sex and contraceptive methods and what they use and, you know, openly and not have stigma and guilt. I mean, I just, I feel as though the more we can do to help sex education earlier on in adolescents' lives and probably even before that, uh, that'll go a long way to to improving uptake. Um, there's a fault question on the implants to in terms of um, why are they more effective and is it because of the three month waiting period after vasectomies and then what about BTLs, which I actually don't know what 
that stands for? Uh, bilateral tubal ligations. Um, okay. I'm not sure I understood the question the, the, uh, it, about oh, the implant. Why are the implants more effective? Is it oh. because? Well, uh, the reason, yeah, I'm not sure we know exactly why they're so fantastically effective, other than we know it, they just, they work really well. Vasectomies have a tendency to fail every so often, pretty rarely. Um, you know, and, and as I said, the difference is so, so, so slight. And, you know, we also measure longer time frames also with a couple that's used vasectomy. Um, you know, it could be a, uh, a longer time frame than what we know of the use of an implant, for example. So that could be simply that. Um, but even so, the, the differences between tubal ligations, vasectomies, IUDs, and implants, they're all incredibly effective. And they're fantastic for a woman or a man who doesn't want to have an operation or procedure. You know, to use an implant or an IUD is a fantastic way to avoid a surgical procedure especially where surgical procedures are inaccessible. Of course. Um, okay, we probably have time for one, maybe two more questions. Mm -hmm. but this, this answer may or may not take a little longer if you want to talk about it. We've had more than one question about male contraception. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the joke about that is, you know, we're likely to see some male contraceptive method in the next five years. And then, you know, people have been saying that for about the last 40 years. Um, yeah, there are some movements, but none of them are incredibly promising, and I, I really can't speak to them a lot. And it's much more complicated to rig or fix the male uh, system. You know, a woman produces an egg every month for a fairly defined time frame in her life, whereas a male produces sperm for a long, long time. And so that's complicated. And it, he produces a lot of sperm. Um, but there are some methods that there are people are working on. There's a gel that I just heard about not too long ago that may work. But yeah, um, someday, that's, that's my dream, that someday we'll have a good effective contraceptive method for males that males could use. So that kind of goes into the next question is, you know, what's number one on your wish list for better contraceptive? That, that would be it, I guess. You know, there, there, I, I was part of a debate not too long ago. Well, do we need new methods or do we have the, the methods that we really could use? We just haven't gotten them out to the right. We haven't gotten them out as well as we could have. And I lean a little bit more towards, we have really, really great effectives. Well, unfortunately, they're only for women for the most part. But we have some really, really great, effective, simple, effective methods, simple methods, and um, we just need to do more work to get them used, to get them out there, to get you know easier, simpler access. Uh, will go a long way to reducing unattended, unplanned pregnancies. Um. Yeah, I think, let's see, I'm seeing if there's another question that would, I feel like a few of these you've covered just in speaking. Um, this one was one, uh, what, percentage of, what percentage of women around the world have access to modern birth control and what percentage still need modern birth control? So that's actually a good segue from. Yeah, well, there's, there's lots of different data on that, but you know, we know that probably 60 to 70% of women in lots of parts of the world, in particular low resource settings, uh, don't have access, access to contraceptive methods. There's a, there's a term we use, unmet need. It just, it's, it's appalling, um, you know, in parts of the world where women have little to no access. They would love to reduce the numbers of kids they have, but they just don't have access. Um, so it's, 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 you know, and, but it's hard to break, the, you need to break those numbers down also because in say the capital of Ethiopia, it's much, much different than in a rural part of Ethiopia. So, you know, what can be said for the country is you know, one particular piece of data, but um, it's, it varies tremendously from lower income groups, higher income groups, social economic strata, et cetera. But yeah, again, a lot of work to be done, it's fun stuff. And we should be celebrating also tomorrow is World Contraceptive Day. So 
celebrate tomorrow. There's really been some great strides in contraceptive methods. Um, so I, I'm happy to hang on for more questions, but I'm probably running out of time. But if, uh, if I don't get a chance to say it, uh, thanks to everybody for joining. Really appreciate it. And thanks for all the volunteers that jumped in.